uh, uh, Jorge Soberon, who is a distinguished professor at the Department of uh, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, one of our neighbors, also far from here. And, um, and Jorge Soberon is also a senior scientist at the Biodiversity Institute at KU. He's been working at KU for the last 10 years. Uh, and before that, he was a, a food professor at the UNAM University in Mexico City. And he has worked also for many, many years at the, um, at the governmental agency uh, about biodiversity in Mexico. And uh, today he's with us, and we are very happy to have him. And he's going to discuss about, uh, you know, uh, biology, theoretical uh, ec uh, ecology, and how to build models, and how is this connected with physicists. So, thank you to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and for being here uh, today. Uh, of course, that that title is, is partially a joke, but not entirely, because it is true that ecologists, theoretical ecologists, tend to look at physicists as the role models and uh, try to do theory in ways that may be uh, not necessarily completely appropriate to the subject of the field of ecology, which is quite different uh, from physics in basically because of the intrinsic messiness and randomness and heterogeneity of the th of the of, of the objects we use to work uh, with in, in in ecology. So um, what I am going to show you is a theory that I am working on since the last several years with other people uh, in in macroecology in a, in a field called macroecology and I'm going to be highlighting what I see m there may be the differences and of course not being a physicist maybe I am completely wrong maybe I have a some cartoonish view of what you really do and if that is the case I would appreciate if you can uh, correct me So why there are no basilisks in Europe? But I'm not talking about those basilisks, I'm talking about this basilisk, which is a mythical animal. Uh, well, and, and, and everybody knows that there are no basilisks in Europe because all of them live in the Libya Cyrenaica, which is this area here, according to Plinium. This is very much a mythological thing, but the real question is, why species, animal and plant species, occur where, where they occur and not anywhere else? That's the question, that's the biological question. Uh, why there are no polar bears in Amazonia? Why there are no Siberian tigers in Alaska? They would do f fairly well there if they were there, but they aren't there. Why there are no hummingbirds in Africa? This, this is the question I will be exploring. Why species are confined? And they are confined because of a variety of reasons. Some of them are ecological. They don't, I mean, polar bears would be miserable in, in, in the Amazon rainforest. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't survive. Their physiology is not right. Um, maybe for some animals there is no the right food or there, is no, uh, there, or there are too many of the predators that would make their lives miserable. There are also historical reasons where they actually originated ecologically. If a species originated <coughs> ecologically in Africa um, after the separation of Pangaea, well, getting across the sea is very difficult, and that's one of the reasons what that explains. And those are also geographical reasons. There is also bad luck, plain and simple. The, one of the things that characterize the work in which I work is that it's very random. There are tons of things that are not the consequence of any law is just the way it happened. And I'm going to present a general scheme to deal with this problem of where the species are. This is something which is not only interesting fundamentally in ecology, but it's also very important practically. Uh, this fire ant is a, it's a, it's a, it's a very bothersome insect that is moving from Argentina well into the United States, causing economic damage, health problems, things like that. Uh, this uh, mosquito, which is now in the United States, uh, 
carries the, the, the several very, very, very nasty diseases and is moving and spreading towards the, the, the west and to, to the north. And this one we want to protect just because it's beautiful. And for, in order for, to do that properly, you need to know where, where it lives and where would be the best places to, to do the conservation. So there are a lot of applied questions related to knowing where a species live, which is the, the subject of my talk. What kind of data we use to model these things? Basically, what we use is a thing called occurrence data, which are observations of a species at a particular time in a particular place. And this, they come from from museums. This is a herbarium, similar to the one we have here. And all these cabinets contain specimens. And the specimens contain the annotations of the name, what, what thing is this in, a, in the hypothetical scheme that taxonomists create, and the date where it was collected, by whom, and where. And the where you can turn into coordinates. So this is what you, where you get the, the data. Um, there is another one. These are the, this is the butterfly collection at the Smithsonian. The behind the scenes, the things that people don't see when you go to the museum there. And, and over the entire world, there are probably in the order of three billion specimens of things like that in all the collections in all the world. Also, amateurs increasingly are contributing data in very large numbers. This is, uh, these are just the observations reported by amateurs, by bird watchers, to a, a repository called eBird. Uh, and, and this is uh, the time of the, of the, the month in a, in a single year, and you see the species coming back from their um, winter time in Mexico and spreading the western side of the US and then going back to the... And this is a very large quantity of data. Uh, just for this particular animation I'm showing, the, I'm displaying just the observations. There is no modeling here. It's just the observations highlighting the number, the frequency. And it's about 80,000 observations just for the US, just for this bird. Uh, eBird right now contains in the order of 120 million observations and keeps accumulating every month because every month new bird watchers go there out in the field and report their things. The problem is that it's mostly for the United States and some European countries and mostly for birds. There is nothing like this for other things. Of the total number of observations of this bird 80,000 come from the United States and less than, well, a little bit more than 1,000 from Mexico. So you see it's very unbalanced. But still it's a, diff, a, a sizable amount of data. It's growing, it's growing uh, linearly. Now it's in the order of a bit more than half a billion specimen records. And they are distributed this way in the world. And you see that, uh, well, uh, the United States has a lot of data, the European countries as well. There is a huge gap here, and there is a huge gap in the Soviet Union and in parts of China, not because they don't have the data, but because they don't contribute the data to this repository, which is called GBIF. So the data may be there, but if it's not computerized, and after being computerized, if it's not shared in repositories like this, well, it's like if it weren't there. With this kind of data, you can calculate areas of distribution. This is one example. And, and, but this is a statistical thing. To just take the points and do perform some statistical regression. It's a regression. Basically, they are regression uh, applications. And you get a description of where the points are as a function of covariates, which are climatic data. And you get a model of a potential area of distribution. But that thing although it works very well and you can do predictions with it and predictions work, uh, it's very static and is basically 
uh, there is no theory behind. There are no concepts behind. There are no ideas behind. It's just a statistical procedure. Data in maps out, and you are done. And you can, if the, if this species is an important species, you go and publish a paper, and that's it. But there is no real understanding of what's going on. So I want my theory, and by that, what I mean. It's not going to be an equation. People oftentimes in, in my area, and that's what the envy of physics is in, in ecology, by theory they mean an equation or a set of equations, a couple, three, four more uh, differential equations that are coupled. What I mean is I want to have definitions of what I am doing and how I am doing, how I am measuring things. Uh, I want my definitions to be mathematical or at least formal, with some rules of what can I do with the symbols and what I cannot do with the symbols. I would love to have it dynamical and very much it should be constrained by the messiness of the data I have. And I'm going to illustrate what I mean by messiness. But essentially is that I cannot assume that uh, the objects I'm working with are, have nice shapes which are mathematically tractable or things like that. Um, maybe I'm dealing with functions, but those functions are not going to be defined by equations, but by tables or of numbers, things like that. And I'm going to present some of the elements towards such a theory. Okay. There are basically three classes of factors that affect where do you see a species. The first one is you have to be in the favorable biotic environment. That means you have to like the place, a, a place in order to exist there. If you are some, if your physiology determines that above 25 centigrade, you're going to start having uh, problems uh, processing that amount of heat. Well, you're not going to be living in a place with the, which is more than that. Or if cold kills you, say, with frost, well, you cannot live in places that where, where there is frost. And the range of humidity that you can tolerate and make uh, your living well also establishes a certain range of um, abiotic conditions. I'm talking about this, the A circle. There is another circle, which is the B circle, and that is your interactions. Who, who's, who, who are your predators? Who kills you? Who preys on you? What are the diseases that affect you? What are your competitors? Are you in, in, in a competitive relationship, say, for the same food or for the same habitat or things like that? You need to be in the right place in terms of biotic interactions as well in order to exist. And finally, you need to be in a place that has been accessible for your movements since the species originated. Uh, the example I gave about, um, about uh, um, having originated in Africa and you are not present, well, you may not be present in, 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 uh, in, in, in the Americas, in the Western Hemisphere, just because there is a big barrier in between. So the three the three factors, the, co the, the coincidence of the three factors, determine where the species can be uh, found. Uh, the, the A circle refers to what is called the fundamental niche by, by Hutchinson, who is a big theory, theoretician of this. In the 50s, he developed many of the ideas that I will be using. Uh, the physiological requirements are referring to the fundamental niche, and these are non-reactive variables, and this is a huge advantage. What I mean by this is the following. The monarch butterfly is severely affected by climate, but the climate, the, the climate is not affected by the presence or absence of the monarch butterfly. The climate is a factor, a condition for the development of the butterfly, but the butterfly does not affect the the climate as, as such, so it's uncoupled. Those two are uncoupled variables. The biotic environment, normally they are coupled. You have to model them using uh, 
coupled differential equations because if you are a hare and there is a lynx eating a population of lynx as well, lynxes deplete the amount of hares and they don't have food anymore and therefore their own dynamic changes. So this is coupled. And M basically refers to the way you disperse. How do you diffuse over heterogeneous environments? Already in trouble with the physics audience. Uh, A refers to the fundamental niche that's uncoupled. Uh, what does this mean? Is it is it like a water supply that's invariant, invariant, no matter how many? The hours? rain the rain is invariant to, uh, to the number of mice of mice in the field. So things you know a priori are decoupled. Yeah. Okay. So those would be things. Actually, I don't know that rain is decoupled because rain depends on the rain forest. And but anyway, things you strongly suspect are high. It's, it's decoupled at certain, for most species of animals and plants, at certain um, time scales. It's decoupled for a decade, for 20 years. But, but there's, a, a lot of, there's a lot of things that are decoupled. Yeah. So to fit into the fundamental niche, it has to be decoupled and what? affect the physiology. So I'm going to give an example. I can give us example. The idea is something that the, that the animals need. Yeah. And which you strongly suspect are decoupled. Yes. Okay. The B the coupled things. B are the coupled things. Your food, if it's a seed. Food, food supplies. Yes. The predators, the competitors the pollinators, things that if, if, if you remove the bees, the plants are going to have a, an effect. And, and you, this A, B, and M layout must be an axiom in your field, otherwise you wouldn't be telling us about it. Or is this for our present? Is it is a presentation device for us? It, it's a it's a heuristic device. It's the way we started thinking about this. Now we have equations behind each one of these things. I'm asking whether it's it's the, it's the foundation of this proto field that you're trying to develop, or whether it's just something you're doing to explain to us this afternoon. It's the foundation. Those are the basic the, assumptions those behind. Are the basic assumptions. Of yes. In the field. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and there are a couple more that I am not adding. For instance, evolution. I'm not adding evolution. So. Hutchinson, this guy that I mentioned before, basically said that there was a, some correspondence between what happens in geography and what happens in, in the abstract environments called niche spaces, which are the spaces where these uncoupled um, conditions occur. So for look at this map here. It's composed of little cells. Every cell here has one and only one correspondence here. This is environmental space I have here, a minimum temperature, a minimum temperature, a maximum temperature of the warmest mount and the amount of precipitation. So every point here has a point here and vice versa. It's just a one-to-one -one relationship because of the precision at which I measure these things or rather than the precision at what meteorologists measure this, you can establish a one-to-one -one relationship. So if I select a subset here, automatically I'm selecting a subset here. And i show you what kind of subsets. Is, is E space a higher dimensional version yeah. of G space? Yeah. G is a projection. G, e? G is coordinates. Then drop down. We reduce the dimensionality of your data going from E to G. Going from E to G, you reduce dimensionality. Right. Yeah. It's a many to one map in one direction. In, yeah, but I discretize this, and I have a table of coordinates, and for each coordinate, I have a point here. And the point here is in many, in, in several variables. Right. So, look at this. This is a real animal. It's a, it's a bug, Brazilian. It transmits a disease called Chagas. If you perform, this is temperature and this is humidity. If you perform cruel experiments on this animal, like raising the temperature until they die, 
or freezing them until they die and removing the and you can do that because they are not loved by people and there are no societies for the preservation of these things or against the cruelty for these things. So you can establish a region where they survive. This is their niche. This is the fundamental niche. Okay? You do this in the lab experimentally. Now you have these two other things. If you intersect this thing with what exists, this is uh, again my E space only in two dimensions because I have more data in two dimensions, it's easier. If you intersect what the results of your experiments with what exists at a given time in a given place, you are in fact selecting or filtering a bunch of points where the species can live and subsist. Okay? I'm going to. If you project these things back into the map, for some reason they don't look well, but uh, you see that there are points in this part of Brazil and in parts of South America and in a lot of parts of Mexico. These are points in geography that have the conditions that that thing likes. But the, 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 the animal only lives in this part of the world. So you see the M factor limiting the distribution. The animal could live perfectly well here, and in fact, there are relatives of that, of that uh, triatoma, different species, but the same kind of group of insects that live in this part of Mexico. And in fact, they are actually moving into the US because the climate is changing and it's getting warmer and they are moving. Uh, so uh, what you see is that this is the A part, all the points here are the A part, which are the intersection of the fundamental niche what, with what exists at a given point in time. But not the entire area is occupied. And in this point I am I'm inventing a little bit because this animal actually lives in all the entire favorable, favorable area in Brazil. But maybe there was a competitor here and that would limit the, the distribution to the south, okay? Just for points of illustration. So you see that there is this um, duality. I have things that happen in environmental space and things that happen in geographical space. And what I see is I have a fundamental niche, the intersection with the actual climate that exists and the projection to uh, geography and that gives me an idea of where the species should be located. And this is an example in three dimensions for a real animal, another one. You see this is the, the I model the niche with an ellipsoid which is sheer physics envy. Why an ellipsoid? Well because it's mathematically tra tractable. Some people use uh, convex hulls. Well, convex hulls are, they are not mathematically nice. They work, but they are not mathematically nice. So in this entire region, which is the climate of North America in three dimensions, North America beginning in Panama, uh, in three dimensions, that animal occupies this part and lives here. So this is the, the relationship between E space and G space. And you, we can do it, I mean, by now we have software and you just pour data into it and you get these things by the thousand. Now, Hutchinson in some of his papers implied, although he never actually expressed them as equations, but he basically with words said that the fundamental niche probably, oh my, what happened here? There is an intersection here which for some reason disappeared in my... There is an intersection here. That's what I was showing you. The fundamental niche contains the red point selected inside the ellipsoid with climate, and that also contains the realized niche, which is where the actual climate of the species lives, because uh, 
after taking into account competitors, predators, barriers to dispersal and everything. So this is called the realized niche and this is the fundamental. This is what you uh, measure with the cruel experiments and this is what you observe in the field. And this is what Hutchinson um, proposed should be the case. And since he proposed this in 1957, there have been no experiments on to check whether this is true or not. One of the reasons is that measuring the fundamental is kind of difficult. Um, so what you need to do is to go, imagine each one of these is a fundamental niche and this is climate at a given time and you take the intersections of all the, the points and this is the fundamental niche for the realized niche for this species and for this species and for this species. Um, I am modeling the fundamental niches with ellipsoids but the climate with smoothers and the smoothers are very very ugly. Uh, you don't even see what they are. It's sums of, of, of arbitrary shapes that model the, the, the points here but uh, the other ones are cute platonic uh, objects. However, the United Nations, FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Administration of the United Nations, commissioned years ago a set of experiments on plants to see where were the limits of those plants and uh, in fact the fundamental niches of plants for 1700, which is quite a large number. And so, and that data set is available publicly. You can go to the internet and download it. And unfortunately, they are not ellipsoids. They are squares, so it ranges from one in one dimension and ranges in another dimension. But that's okay. You begin with what you have. And eventually, we will have the covariances as well. Right now, it's just the um, different rectangles. So I can, I can do a lot of things with, uh, with my rectangles and check uh, Hutchinson's equations. The data for the realized niches come from GBIF and it's about 2.5 million records for those 1700 species of plants. And this is where they should lie, this is the square where they should lie, assuming that they are inside the fundamental niche as Hutchinson predicted, and yes they are. So uh, for this data set, 70% of the points are inside where they should be. And that's very satisfactory, very, very satisfactory, because these are two completely different and independent data sets. One compiled by the Agricultural Organization of the United Nations for agricultural and forestry purposes, and GBIF is just observations. And the theory says that the observations, the climate of the observations should be inside the boxes that I just showed you, and that's what happens, and that's very nice. So we have some building blocks. We have climate data in petabytes. This is the uncoupled data. We have observations in terabytes. And we have some hypotheses and equations on how those things should be related. And that those are the beginnings of a theory. But now I want to make it dynamic. Um, what I just told you. Before you start that. Yeah, yeah. So, the Hutchinson's set of inequalities, if I understand them, completely circular. If, if your definitions are consistent, you test them because you're not sure if, you're, if your data is actually getting an interesting they, chunk of the fundamental niche. They're not circular. You could, you could and there are many mechanisms. Something violate. I will, 29 species violated entirely, and those are species that are cultivated. If, if, you, if you define the fundamental niche wrong, so that you don't really know where the animal lives, no, but don't then it's not going to work. But otherwise, if, you, if the fundamental niche has some boundary conditions on what the animals can do, then where they can be found is inside the They can be found outside if, for instance, what happens, people uh, irrigate them. It, which means it's a violation of the definition. It means that in nature, but you remember that the fundamental is a physiological thing. 
and the realized is something that you see occurring in nature. So it could be the case, and it is the case, that some species are outside the boundaries that the lab will tell you, but just a few. It's a minority, and most of them, the ones I found, are because are outside because people helps them to be outside their boxes. I see what you mean, but but listen, I'm I'm not saying that the fundamental niche is changed in the field. What I am saying is that the fundamental niche contains what is in the field, and it may there are cases which are are exceptions, but certainly people are not changing the fundamental niche by, by adding water to a field. Right. The point is that up to here you have evidence that these, uh, let's say, survival studies for the fundamental niche are reasonably consistent with what you find out in nature. Yeah. Okay. And then there are, there are still going to be hidden degrees of freedom. Yes. But you haven't got close to that yet. Now, well, you set up a dynamical system until you know something about your other degrees of freedom. But what I see now is that the fundamental niche does predict a lot of the presence of the species, at least 70% uh, of the cases for 1,700 species with 2.5 million observations. So that is kind of... Fine. So now, now you're ready to get started. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is to, uh, the, the A circle is the fundamental niche. M can be model, is the dispersal. So you model the dispersion of the dispersal of, of the animal or the plant using partial differential equations or whatever. B, which is the interactions, I, I just admit I cannot deal with, nobody can. Uh, there are, there are just very recently, this year, a few theoretical results showing how to deal with this in serious ways. Everybody can go and study um, a competitive interaction in a field outside here, but to do it geographically is very different, and there are very, very serious problems to do that. So I'm not going to talk about B. And the only thing that I want to stress is that I know how E changes and I'll show you. To drive the algorithm that I'm going to show, I'm going to use uh, climate data from general circulation models. And this come from the Hadley Center. I'm going to use, uh, res uh, for the entire planet, for just two variables, uh, back to the interglacial, which was 120,000 years ago. Um, subsetted for North America, and that's giving me 120 time slices, but I have 10 times more, courtesy of Hadley. So, this is temperature, and this is precipitation, and this is time before present, and this is how it's changing, the climate in North America. You see how this is going towards the max glacial maxim, uh, the interglacial, which is similar to the present. And then this is the glacial, and then goes back. So it's a cycle. And you see, these are, this is the data from the, the general circulation models. So I can use this to drive the dynamics of my scheme. This is the niche of these animals. And these are the points that are inside a particular time. And this is the map. And probably that color is not too good, so I'm going to select another one. So you see how climate change is within, within a fixed niche. The niche is fixed. I'm assuming that there, is no, there are no changes in the niche. It's driving the area of distribution of this thing north and south and with splits just by, by changing. Just climate, nothing else. And if I had more variables, I could do this. This is a trick, this is an interpolation. I don't trust it, so I just put there to show that you can do it with more variables if you want. So this is a theory 
for single species. And now I think it's a theory, a good theory in the sense that I have, I have definitions, operational definitions, things that I can go and measure. I can get data, there is data for these things, and I have a theoretical structure that relates everything and seems to be working and seems to be compatible with the data. But it's for a single species. I want to have a lot of species. I want to have entire floras and faunas. For that, and that would be a theory of biodiversity. Like, for instance, this, this is for all the mammals in the Western Hemisphere. Most mammals in, 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 in the Western Hemisphere occur in this part of the world and here. How do you do that? Well, for that, I need more assumptions. I'm going to overlay the, the distributions of each one of them. Uh, like this, these are different uh, orioles, and if you overlay them in, in, in a particular place, you get how many are in that particular place, assuming, assuming that there are no interactions. I will be dealing with interactions, I hope, in the future, but right now I am assuming that there are no interactions. So if you have a matrix of interactions, all the off-diagonal elements are going to be zero. Second thing, I'm going to assume that all world is available. It's called the Hutchinson world. Uh, M, the accessible area, contains the favorable environment. So there are no barriers, there are no islands, there are no mountain ranges that you cannot pass. It's a, it's a strong assumption, but it's an assumption explicit and I can deal with it later. And finally, I am using the Kansas model, which means no evolution. Um, that means that my, those ellipsoids do not change shape and do not move in space. So no changes in position and no changes in the matrix that defines the ellipsoids. And with that, I can remember that I have my, my niches and my space, so I'm just going to overlay all of them. In what you are going to see, I'm overlaying 400 of them. Well, first, with that kind of thing, now I can do a lot of, there is a lot of theory that I can, I, I can, I can produce because I can do integrals over those uh, regions of, uh, of climatic space and I can show, for instance, that the average number of species, which is this, and the average area of distribution are the same. This is a theorem that it can be proven. Uh, it's actually an equation that was empirically uh, presented in the 50s by a guy called Whitaker, but uh, it's a consequence of what I have shown. Uh, and there are many other things you can do. You can take the time derivative of the average number of species and it's just the time derivative of the climate. The niches are out there because I am assuming Kansas model, no, no changes with time. So what drives the, 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 the average number of species in a, in, a, in a region is climate, entirely climate. And that's a very nice result. It's, it's very suggestive, can be tested, and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's powerful enough. And this is what you see. These are 400 species of mammals stacked on top of each other, assuming that the, the niches do not change. And you see the, the number of species changing. Purple means there are about 80 species, red means one or two or none. And you see the mean number of species changing with time and the shared number of species. Because if I have what I show, uh, all the, the niches, I can calculate any index that you want to calculate. All the indices that ecologists have produced in the past, nestedness, uh, variance indices, beta diversity, alpha diversity, gamma diversity, all of them can be calculated from those uh, objects that I presented before. So in a sense, I have my full theory of biodiversity only based on the assumptions I mentioned, which are strong assumptions, no interactions, full capacity to disperse, no evolution, but kind of works. And it does what the fossils tell us that it should be uh, happening. So maybe I have a practical theory now. It relates different fields, articulates concepts, it uses the data, 
and stipulates actual operations on how to measure things and makes testable predictions. It's not elegant in the sense that it's driven by the messy tables of data. Uh, it's uh, maybe it's computer sciences envy because what I have to do is to be able to manipulate really large amounts of data in terms of uh, some ideas, but the ideas are very general. The ones that I show, the BAM diagram. Uh, and now I'm going to, to conclude by showing you what is next, uh, well, what I have to do in the future. Uh, is it possible to add evolution? Yes. Then I have to do a theory of how the position and the shape of the niche changes. And that is very complicated. This is work done basically by Miller, a mathematician that worked with me as a postdoctoral associate for two years. And he actually solved uh, analytically the problem of how uh, natural selection will change the position and the aspect of that those um, ellipsoids. Uh, it's, it's a difficult pro paper to publish in biological journals because there are more than 20 pages of really, 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 um, well, it's serious math. He had to invent generalized transposes and things like that to deal with these things. And, but uh, you can. It's very complicated. And the nice thing is that it doesn't seem to matter much. Evolution takes place and those niches change position, but very, very, very slowly, much slowly, much slower than climate. Climate is changing very, very fast in, in order of uh, hundreds or thousands of years and niches changing one order of magnitude slower. So that, that, that's nice because our Kansas model is not such a stupid thing after all. Another thing, I would like to be able to estimate the fundamental niche rigorously without having to, to perform the cruel experiments on the, on the little animals. And this is work that I am doing with a, a doctoral student, Laura, which is sitting there, and an associate in Mexico, Andres Christen. And it's a way of calculating from data and from Bayesian hypothesis about um, Bayesian hypothesis to calculate those niches. And finally, what about the interactions? Well, here be dragons with interactions. It's really a complicated thing. This is something that whoever solves uh, how to, not only the theory, the theoretical part, which is complicated, because we're talking about thousands of species. And some of them are predators of others, some of them are competitors of others. The, the combinatorics of all the possibilities is absolutely staggering. So how do you deal with that? And the second thing is that if we have a lot of data for the other things, for this, there is no data. Well, there is data, but the data changes. An example, the same spider on the same flower acts as a, as, as a, as a predator for the insects that come there as pollinators, and the flower gets a um, negative sign of the interaction in the part of the world where the visitors are uh, pollinators. But just a few miles after, uh, away, the insects that come are, are um, seed predators. So the spider is benefiting the plant. Same species. In one place, they are a plus minus interaction. In another place, they are a plus plus interaction. So the structure of the equations change. It's, it's really quite complicated. So this part is the frontier of the field. The past, we have had great people in ecology suggesting a lot of ideas, and presently we have tons of data and the, um, and the computation capacities that those guys just dreamed about. Uh, but I think that the future is basically theoretical. And the theory is this, the capacity to see, to stick to the important uh, assumptions and the important uh, 
knows that you know about your system, but let you be driven by the huge amount of data and information that is coming all the time from sensors, from remote sensing, for, from climatic data, from amateur scientists and for, for the professional scientists. That is what I think it's going to be really, really, really very interesting. And thank you very much. I would like to say thanks to all the people. I have not done this myself. It's a collaboration with Town Peterson, with Miguel Nakamura from Mexico, uh, Richard Pearson, well, friends here, Raul Jimenez, Laura Jimenez, and others. And thank you to all of them for their help, and thanks for, to you for having been here. Uh, not, not, not too much, but it's massive. So you can do, you can perform a lot of statistics on that. That's a good question. And in fact, you know, you cannot even trust the professional data either. Uh, there are misspellings. There are problems with uh, georeferencing. Some people forget to add a minus sign, so you get like mirror images of the actual position in geography because they forgot to add the minus and. The rule of thumb in my field is that the data you take, you are going to end with about 40% of it after all the debugging. And that includes the professional data as well. The amateurs, I mean, some people claim to have seen extinct species that everybody knows they are extinct and it would be so exciting to see that you go and look for it and it's there and you just publish it. But there are ways of dealing with this. You, John, you look like you have a lot of questions <laughs> or comments. One of the things you may not know about, I'm sure you do know about physics, is that we only work on easy stuff. <laughs> 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 Don't, you have easy <laughs> Don't you have any little easy areas where there's only three species on a, a things that are island or some island, sub island, or some. Uh, Yes, yeah. just tell you know, what, why do you want to focus on the fleas that live on Iceland? Well, when you are in an island, you, ha you are in a situation which is called. Isn't there some easy thing which doesn't yeah. have too many degrees of freedom where you could get, a, get good studies on it? Get good data. Of course. You can, uh, and, 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 and of course, I could do experiments in the lab. And there would, yeah, but then, then I am fully into, into the envy of physics field. Reality is like this. Reality has this amount of degrees of freedom. You want to use your data. Well, that's... Uh, that's fine. But I think I have to deal with that, not, not pretend that it's not like that. It's, it's, it, that, that point is much more important in ecology than it is in physics. Well, I, actually, I think it's much more interesting to use, to make use of vast amounts of data, which you don't understand, than to do some boring thing with a small system that's true. So, makes sense. Still, I, there are many, many questions here that require either numerically uh, numerical methods that I cannot deal with, or theoretical problems that I cannot deal with. Uh, there, are, there are many questions that would require me to be able to perform uh, multiple integrals easily and, and know about the theorems that define what happens when you're con there are conservation laws. I have no idea how to do that. There are interesting questions despite the fact that it's very simplified in some sense and despite the fact that there are a lot of data. Yes? It would be interesting to see if you just pick a species out of the blue and see what, I mean, once the theory is fully developed, and see what the predictive power of the theory is. Mm -hmm. The predictive power. Yes, well, it's actually very predictive. Peterson, for instance, our, my colleague that works in the museum, he predicted there was going to be a, an Ebola hotspot in Angola, and everybody in the field laughed, laughed at him. He was using these methods. Two years after he 
published the paper, there was an outbreak of Ebola exactly where Marburg, not Ebola, exactly where he predicted it. And we have used these methods to predict places where there are going to be invasive species, places where you will find uh, rare animals or plants that are and, and the Australians that are the, the leaders of this field, they have been doing this for years. But it's very statistical. I mean, you do, just do the, the things and you get a map and you go to a place where nobody has collected and probably you, my bet is you will find the species there. But it's not very interesting. It's very practical. Not very interesting. It's done using uh, circulation models, which are the climate change models, only run backwards. And the people in those centers, what they do is to speculate about the amount of CO2 in the air and the amount of um, some, of, some other things. There are several parameters for these GCMs. GC, these GCMs are very much physics, entirely, well, well, climatic physics. And they just run them backwards. And I was fortunate enough to have a person in, 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 in Hadley that allowed, uh, gave us uh, experiments every 100 years, which is pretty, pretty, I mean, this, this data has not been published. It was produced by them. But this is uh, the running of general circulation models. I think it's uh, solving Navier-Stokes equation. I'm not sure. I have one, another question. Yeah. You, you've been saying that you, you, you use MB a little bit, the, the physicist's uh, approach to things. And are there physicists working on this field? And how many of them? And is there something that you... Are they useful? Are they, and is what they do, are they, are they no, useful? There are. Is it? There are physicists and one of the things that I find most interesting and most useful is that they are dealing with the spread part, the movement part, that the M circle, which is to model that you need to model using uh, partial differential equations. And, um, and that is demanding. Uh, it's partial differential equations with, uh, with coefficients that change in time and space. So you cannot assume that the d of the, of the, 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 the your parameter d in a, in, a, in, 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 a, in, a, in a diffusion equation is constant. It's changing in time and it's changing in space in very ugly ways because, for instance, if you get to a range of mountains, well, that D changes entirely. And if you are 1,000 years ago, it also changes. So, and there are physicists working on this. People that came from an area of percolation theory or, or even um, some geologists that are used to, to model things that spread on very heterogeneous me, uh, uh, media. They do that. So uh, yes, um, mostly in Germany, there is a couple of groups in Germany that are doing this uh, from from that perspective. So they add to my forced uh, system with climate. They add dispersal, and that complicates things very much. But it's it's feasible, and it's it's an avenue that is being pursued right now. So th thanks, thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you.